Welcome back to Discovering Geometry with Mrs. Barry. This is lesson 12. Today we're going to talk about mathematical modeling. So I know you know of physical models, and they have many of the same features as the original object or activity that they represent, but they are more convenient to study, usually a lot smaller. For example, you could build a new airplane and test it, but it would be very difficult and expensive. However, you could analyze a new airplane design by building a small model and putting it in a wind tunnel for testing. In the first chapter, we've learned that geometry ideas such as points, lines, planes, triangles, polygons, and diagonals are mathematical models of physical objects. So while you could do a physical model of a complicated telecommunications network, it might not be practical, but a mathematical model of the network could use points and lines and be generated a lot easier. So we're gonna start with an investigation. This is best acted out first, and then we'll create a mathematical model. So if you have the ability, I would like you to gather a small group of friends or family to model this problem in real life. After I read the problem, you can pause the video and gather your people and model this in person. Each of 30 people at a party shook hands with everyone else. How many handshakes were there all together? So again, if you have a few family members around, pause and model this with one, two, three, maybe up to five people. You can use this chart to help you keep track of everything. If you weren't able to act it out, let's try drawing a few stick, pe stick people on paper and counting the handshakes. So here's one person. They can't shake hands with anybody, so that's zero. Here's two people. They're gonna shake hands together, and that would be one. Here's a third person. We already have the one handshake. Now the first person can shake hands with the third person, and the second person can shake hands with the third person. So it appears that we have three handshakes when we have three people. What about a fourth person? Now this fourth person could shake hands with the first person, the second person, and the third person. So that adds three more handshakes to what we already had of three. So now we're up to six. What about if we draw a fifth person? We can add one, two, three, four more handshakes. So 10, how many will it take to get to 30? Are you able to make some generalizations? How many handshakes do you think there will be with 30 people? Take a second and see what you think. In this case, there's no constant rule like we've had before. If we look at the difference here, we're adding one. We're then adding two. Now we're adding three. We're adding four. Counting up like this, we can keep going and maybe make a table all the way to 30. But how do we make a rule for that? Let's see if we can do some more mathematical modeling and, and figure it out. Acting out this problem can be helpful. However, it has its limitations. Do you have 30 people that you could gather together? What about if we wanted to gather 100 people to figure out how many handshakes there would be? We can make mathematical models for some of these problems. For example, with the handshakes, we could draw points for people and lines to represent their handshakes. So let's see what that would look like. Here's one person, there's zero handshakes. Two people, there's one line in between. Three people, there's three lines in between. Now with four people, it gets a little more complicated. We have one, two, three, four, five, six lines. For five people, we know that we get up to 10 lines. 
And for six people, you'd have to count the six around the sides, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So you get up to 15 different line segments, different diagonals that you're connecting there. But do we want to even keep drawing this to 30 dots? What could our rule be? So let's look at this. There are three points here, and each point can connect to two other points, right? Because it doesn't need to connect to itself. So three times two is how many ways we can connect, but one line has two ends. So three times two divided by two segments, or divided by two because every point, every segment comes from two different directions. So every point can connect to two other segments that aren't touching, that aren't the same point. And then we have to think that we've counted each segment twice. Right here, this segment was counted on this end and this end. So we have to divide by two. What about over here? There's four points and each point can connect to three other points. And then we've counted each segment twice. So we need to divide by two. What about here? There's five points, they connect to four other points. But then again, we've counted each segment twice. So we're gonna divide by two. Does this give us the correct answer? Three times two is six divided by two is three. Four times three is 12 divided by two is six. Five times four is 20 divided by two is 10. So right here, there's six points. They connect five different ways. And then we divide by two because we've counted them all twice if we do that. So 30 divided by two is 15. Now, do we see the pattern? Can we fill in this chart with n right here? We gotta get a little creative in how we're gonna fill in the chart, um, but we can fill in numbers at least so far. We have three, we know that this one is six and 10 and 15. And what we were doing is the number of points, right? This one was the number of points and then one number down. So n is the number of points. One number down would be n minus one. And then we divide it by two. So 30, if we plug that in, is going to be 30 times 29 divided by two. What answer do you get for 30 people? So 30 times 29 is 870. And then when we divide by two, we get 435. So 435 handshakes with 30 people. So without a constant difference in this handshake problem, we had to come up with a new rule. And it was a little bit hard to figure out. This exact set of numbers is actually called triangular numbers, one, three, six, 10, 15, et cetera. If you look at the dots and how we can arrange them, they get arranged in triangles. One dot, three dots, six dots. If you've ever built towers, uh, maybe with cups or Legos, you would have done this pattern. You know that 10, well, is what we use for bowling pins, um, but it makes a triangle. So where do the triangular numbers come from? They actually come from rectangular numbers. Let's rearrange those triangles just a little bit. Same triangle shape, one and then three right here, but we've just adjusted this triangle a little bit. And why did we do that? Because when we adjust it a little bit, we can see that this triangle is half of a rectangle. So look here, this is our first rectangle. 
Here is our second rectangle. And here are our triangular numbers right there. So half of six is our three, our triangle. Here's our next one. We have 12 all together. And then our triangle is these six. So notice these are not squares. It's not a three by three, it's actually a three by four. And we also know that the area of a triangle is half of a rectangle. It's half of the length times width, right? The area of a triangle is one half its length times its width. So notice these are rectangles, not squares. To get the total number of dots in the rectangular array, we're gonna find the area that would be this length times width or length times height. Um, so we'd multiply three times four, and then we're gonna divide by two because the triangle is only half. In the case of this rectangular array, the nth rectangle has n times n plus one dots in its area. So the triangular number has n times n plus one over two dots because we started here with one. If we had started with zero, we would have had the same that we had before, n times n minus one over two, if we started with zero dots. Um, but in this case, if we start with one dot, then we can say it's n times n plus one divided by two. So one times two divided by two is our one. Very interesting patterns here that you'll get to explore more in the homework.